A little bit of background about myself. Uh, I have a PhD in applied math, and I did a lot of computational geometry as part of that work, which is why I like the geometry of OSM and find it interesting. Uh, but what I do for my day job is I'm a software engineer at Strava, and it's, it's nice because we end up with a lot of, of, lot of geodata. So if you don't know what Strava is, it's a fitness tracking website. You basically grab a GPS, whether that's your phone or a Garmin or some other thing, you outride a run, you upload it to the website and app, and then we show you all sorts of great things and connect with your friends and stuff. So the interesting part of this, at least to mappers here, is that we have a lot of GPS data and right now it's about uh, 120 million rides, 2 million rides, or rides and runs a week. So it's growing really fast and what this talk is about is basically how we can use that data for good things. So one way we're using that data right now is for a route builder. So it's uh, based off of OSM and then in our routing algorithm we use the route popularity to uh, give you a better route that you know, follows popular routes versus just uh, the shortest route. And we're also using uh, OSM from, via Mapbox for our mobile apps. Uh, in our feed, we use the map. So uh, that's how we're using uh, OSM map data, but this talk is really about what we're doing to complete the loop and give back to the community. So we want to help make the map better. And making the map better means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. For us, it's mostly just about geometry. So the geometry, most specifically connections for routing and then better representation of the roads and trails. So a lot of our, our users uh, just can't route on trails because they just don't exist in OSM or anywhere, really. So we're trying to improve that. So you know, a couple of the common errors, you guys are probably all familiar with this, you know, ways that cross that don't create a node, uh, you know, ways that are close but don't actually touch. You know, these are errors that you know, don't really uh, show themselves in like a tile layer or anything like that, but in routing they're kind of a big deal and we get a lot of complaints from our users about it. What do we do with those complaints? Well, we basically just put them on a map and leave them there right now. Uh, but it's, we, we put them on this map, we let users like report the errors and put them on, uh, and we put them on this map. and. Uh, it's kind of like a low-tech solution of detecting routing errors, of having users submit. And uh, short term, I'd like to see these errors like get put in OSM notes or you know, map roulette or something like that. Long term, uh, I'm sure we can detect these errors automatically using our data and maybe you know, prioritize it or you know, provide like, more of a specific challenge of we know that the routing sucks, sucks here and improve it, something that like, Waze did in the past. But a lot of times we get errors like this, like, hey, that bike trail doesn't exist in the map. So what you're looking at here is just the OSM base map with our heat map data on top. So that blue, purple, reddish line there is about 100 billion, or 200 billion of our data points and 100 million rides aggregated together, all those GPS data points. So redder is hotter, bluer is colder, and we have this uh, worldwide data set. And so you can see that from this like heat map data that there's clearly some sort of bike running path there. And it's also very complicated and twisty for reasons that I don't understand. But it's there in real life, but it's not there in OSM. And we have a lot of people, and we wanna trace that, we wanna add that. So people have made us aware of that, but uh, you know, this, this next one, you don't have to read what he says there, but he basically encapsulates kind of the use case for this slide is, you know, I'm trying to route this trail, it doesn't work because it's not in there, it's not accurate. You can see the brown is the OSM data and the red is the actual heat map where the trail is. But he says, can't you just take my ride and, or he, he says, you know, I could put it in there manually, but it's gonna take like a thousand clicks to make it happen. Or can't you just take my ride and just use that as the path? Or can't you take the hundred rides that I've done on this trail and come up with a good, good estimation of where the route is? So that basically is the concept behind the slide tool is how can we take, you know, 120 million rides worldwide and use that to auto draw some geometry. So let me give you a quick demo here. Pray to the demo gods that it all works out fine. So what I'm showing you here is kind of a demo tool that I built for slides so it's a way to illustrate how it works. I'm gonna to get to the ID integration later of how it's built into that. But basically this is that same area. Uh, again, the, the brown is the OSM data 
and then the red is the trail. So you can see that there's pretty clearly a trail there. If you look at the uh, satellite imagery, that's where the trail is. But if you want to, if you want to, the way slide works is you enter in a course estimate for what your, what your route is. So something like that, and you click slide. And so what happens is the input is the black line, the output is the green line, and the red lines in between are the intermediate steps it took to get from the black to the green. So let's look at that again. So I can show you another example that takes a little bit longer here. Uh, So the, the server came back in you know, two-tenths of a second, and the animation just takes a little bit longer to help you get a feel for what's happening there. So again, the, the input is the black, like, rough line. So this could be, like, an already, like, undersampled OSM way or something like that. But let me go back to some details. Uh, so, so let me just give some common uh, some answers to some common questions here about how it works. So it's a server-side tool, so it's not like running the JavaScript. It takes like a round trip to get back. Uh, it leverages our data set. So that like uh, blue and red tile layer heat map data that you saw was just like one embodiment of that aggregate data. And then it iteratively improves the line. So that's what you saw with the red, is it tries to go through and optimize the line and see how it works. So, so at a high level, like how's the algorithm working? Well, we take that heat data and we generate a surface like this. So we take, a, uh, we generate a, a surface like this. So we basically treat our GPS data points, which we have like 200, 220 billion data points and just build this like density distribution of where GPS data points should be. And then, you know, the denser places are deeper and we smooth it and you get the surface. And then we take your input line, which is that coarse like black line from before, and imagine it as like a string of beads and just put it out there and let like gravity do its thing. So it just rolls down into the valleys and then, you know, once it stops moving, you can assume that it's gonna follow that path of high density and that's, yeah. So that's pretty much the high level idea, like more detailed, this is since my description said this was a technical talk, I'm going to talk about the tech, <laughs> some loose technical terms. So it's just this concept of iteratively refining. And I talk about it a lot because it's kind of a big issue for me because a lot of our algorithms at Strava are not iteratively based and kind of just like go from one end of the ride to the next instead of like treating the object as a whole and try to improve it, which is what's happening here. So in mathematical optimization, you have like a cost, a cost function that you try to improve on every step. So the cost function I'm using here is just like the depth in that surface that I told you before. And then these two other factors to like maintain equidistance between the points. Uh, I should say that the, the point is, re, uh, the line is resampled at first to give you like, since it's still like gonna be a discrete line in your algorithm to give you that flexibility. But those resampled points, we need to maintain distance in between and make sure that the, uh, the angle between the points is maintained big so that it doesn't collapse on itself. So those last two things are just there to like kind of maintain the rigidity of the line. Otherwise, you, you'd get like the line to just collapse in on itself or something like that. And, uh, those are necessary from trial and error. You know, this is kind of the big, the big overview slide, which is, uh, you know, you can read later on your own time, but the basic idea is just how the, the heat data comes in and then it loops through and gets this correction vector every time, takes in a little bit of momentum to, uh, which is just a, a, a percentage of the previous correction vector from the previous uh, loop, which helps to make it converge a lot faster. And then once it doesn't improve anymore, we simplify the line and, and it's on its way. Uh, so, the, what I showed you before was kind of like the demo to kind of get that like, wow, like this is how it's working with iteratively refined things. I've also uh, incorporated an ID. So why ID? Well, because I write JavaScript in my job and not Java, so I didn't do like a JASM plugin. But uh, it's just a self-hosted fork of, of the tool. And it is available live like right now. I don't know how your internet is right now, but you can go to this website and what I'm gonna show you is there. So I just kind of want to make that clear that it's kind of a 
how it works. So this is that same area loaded in ID. So you know, this, this is kind of an area that I've known has been a problem for months, but I've just been saving it for this talk. <laughs> so maybe when you go back here later. So what you do is you can select multiple, multiple nodes on the same way, and it'll slide the in-between part. So that's kind of how you do a subsection of a way, or you can just select the whole way, and it'll just slide it. So you can do that, and it slid the part. And then you'll notice that this middle section here didn't quite make it, didn't, didn't quite work. So you can you know, go in, move that down here, then select the whole thing, click slide again, and it moves in. So uh, it is a way of correcting ways. Uh, I should mention here that I'm not envisioning this as just kind of like a bot that's just going to run over the entire OSM data set. This is a tool for you know, experienced OSM editors to optimize their time. I mean, like, like we kind of heard in the like previous talks is we don't want, you know, pointing and clicking and tracing buildings and tracing ways and stuff is time consuming and tedious. Like what can we do using data sets available to us to make that step faster? So, you know, kind of some examples here. You can just take the whole way, slide it. Notice that it didn't quite work there, so that's quite why you need like a human there. But you can slide it again, and it matches. Some ways it doesn't work is if you kind of want to trace this part, it kind of collapses in right there. So it doesn't work in all cases. There's actually like there's parameters you can turn on how exactly you build that that uh, surface off the heat map data to make it work. But you know, like any sort of parameter, it kind of has its pros and cons. So if, kind of tuned it to work best for my interests. You know, just to give you kind of another example of this, this is, I don't know if you guys can see it up there, but it's that same example I showed before of this, this trail that isn't in there, and it's super windy, so, you know, resampling it and like a bunch of data points could take forever, literally. But, you know, with, with this tool, it's just one click away and just does that. And, uh, in this case, if you zoom in, we'll see if the internet does well for us here. You can see it's right on the center of, well, you guys can't see. I can see on my computer, maybe you can't see. But it is right like at the center of the bike path. So it does do a good job of actually uh, resampling that. Uh, so that's the ID tool in its current state and how it works. So. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about, let me just check the time. The, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was how this can be used without the Strava data set. So all the stuff that I showed uses like the Strava data, which you know, the, the, pop, the main use cases for that would be like trails and even like, like kind of like windy rural roads. You get a lot, of, uh, a lot of cyclists like to go out and ride out of less popular places where it's popular. But, you know, this, this is that same area again, but the uh, yellow is the tiger data. So wouldn't it be great if we could just slide to that? You know, uh, a, lot of, a lot of times, I mean, you guys are probably experienced with this, you go to a city and the old import from the tiger is just jittered up and just doesn't work. You load this like tiger base layer and it's perfect. You know, wouldn't it be great if you could just say, hey, you know, just like slide it to that, like move it in. Can we slide more complex geometries than just a line? So. That's kind of what I'd like to see, like something like this tool go forward. But ultimately, I'm just kind of trying to use data that's available to us now, like from Strava specifically, since I have access to it. We have all this new data. Like, how can we use it to improve tracing and just make it a fast, just make it faster and easier to get the data in there? Because I mean, tracing complicated trails, I've watched my coworkers do it forever, and it's just not fun. Not fun to watch. Uh, so uh, that's pretty much a quick run through of what I have. I just, just want to reiterate again that this isn't like vaporware or something that I'm just showing for this project. Like you can, you can use it today like at labs.strava, and we have a few other things there like this global heat map, which is 100, it's 100 million rides and runs and about 220 billion GPS points all aggregated down to zoom level 17. So it's kind of like an interesting uh, example of where people ride. 
Uh, we also that routing tool that I showed you before that I hope gets put into something more visible, and then this slide tool too. So uh, I'd really like your feedback on how useful you'd find a tool like this, and whether you know it's worth <laughs> trying to fix it. Right. Sure. Maybe. Um, are, are you guys uh, using or uh, probably not? Part? Have you considered also including the OS and APIs traces into the database? Uh, I have not, uh, just because it's a fraction of what the data we have, and in my experience, we have way more. Can you repeat the question, please? Oh, yeah. Uh, the question was whether to incorporate GPS traces into into my data, into the Strava data set. And there's no reason you can't do that. It's just kind of hasn't happened. Yeah. Along those lines, um, how many GPS traces would you need for the algorithm to work effectively, like if you're going to apply the algorithm to GPS data sets that you had from a different application or Uh Not very many. Uh, okay, so the question is, how many GPS traces do you actually need to get it to work? And so that demo tool, which is, again, available on the website, uh, kind of lets you try that out to, like, see, oh, well, you know, the heat map data is very sparse here. Like, how well does it slide to that? And it works pretty well, and there's a lot of parameters to tune to make it better. So depending on if you're, if you're trying to use it for in a, in a use case that you only have few data, you could probably tune it to work that way. But a lot of times what happens is, you know, you still want like trails to be separated and stuff. So it, it there's, there's ways to fix it. Yeah. Also a related question, not so much incorporating the GPS uh, uploads from OSN into the Strata, Strata database, but rather if I've just uploaded my own GPS tracks, can I use something like your tool to to create the trail and at least just save some of the clicking part? Yeah, so the question is, can you just do it off of one track? And the and Multiple of my own, say. Yeah, no, not right now, but there's no reason you can't. And this is kind of like an initial tool. Uh, uh, yeah, so I mean, the, the sky's the limit on what's possible. We're just kind of uh, thinking about ways to to go from, to, to use, use the data set to make it better. You could just use one and just slide to your one. Uh, that, that's work, that would work fine. But I mean, in, in that case, like if you even look at the OSM traces data, that it's not quite, it's not quite as accurate as like the aggregate set that we have available to us. Yeah, question back. I don't know if you already covered this, but uh, do you do, uh, does it do polygons as well? Like, does it close polygons? Uh, like, around, like, build the outlines or like, things like that? Uh, the question is whether it does polygons, and no, it just does ways. So, again, like, there's no reason, like, conceptually, there's no reason why it can't do that, but right now the focus is on, like, mapping trails, basically. Or like uh, the other use cases, you know, you go out into the rural where the, the rural area, the the OSM data is undersampled or whatever, and you just want to make it more accurate, make it more like compatible to reality. So it's just kind of like a almost like a one-click method to make that like really like piecewise curve into like a smooth curve. Yeah. Slightly uh, tangential. What's your heat map? What are you using in the back end to do the heat map generation? Uh, custom code to do that. So this is, I think, this area I was showing somebody else earlier. So the question is, like, what do we use to build the heat map? Uh, it's all stuff that I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mixture of C and Go. Um, yeah, it's just there. I don't know what the internet will say here, but. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Question. More of a comment, I guess. It sounds like the Telenap is doing a lot with GPS or string science and talk to those guys, but probably a bit of connected at the moment, but in the room, but uh, several things. Yeah, so the so comment is on using, talking to the Telenap guys. Yeah, like, what I, what I would like to do is kind of auto-detect routing errors off of our data set. So, you know, if a bike went there and we couldn't route it, like, why not? Is it because you cut through some weird fence or is it because, you know, there's no connection there? That's kind of like down the road, really. <laughs> 
All right, cool. So I encourage you to check it out and let me know any feedback. I'm really interested in what the community here has to say.